now. Um, uh, hello, everyone. I'm Sally Miu, and I'm from Vietnam Marxist. Thank you to everyone who participated today. Uh, we have a very special guest, that is Professor Marcelo Musto. Uh, thank you so much for accepting my invitations and coming here to interact with Marxists in Vietnam and other countries. Uh, even though you have some problem accessing to the Zoom, uh, I'm so sorry about that. Um, <laughs> and uh, currently, the meeting will be live on the Mana Manchi Postacom channel by Feraya. Thank you, Feraya. And I want to note that everyone will be mute during the meetings and questions will be asked through the ch chat box. So now I will leave the stage to our main host presenter, Hugh. Hugh, let's begin. Thank you, Vian. And uh, uh, once more, I would like to extend my welcome to all the international audience who, who are currently attending this meeting. Thank you so much for the attendance. It means a lot to us, especially for such a small group as ours. So as always, I will begin with a very, very brief introduction of, Dr., uh, of Professor uh, Marcelo Musto and his works. So uh, Marcelo Musto is a professor of sociological theory at York University in Toronto, and is known globally for his studies on Karl Marx and Marxism. His publications include four single authored books, 11 edited volumes, and 50 journal articles and book chapters. His work has been translated worldwide in 25 languages, and his writings have appeared in dozens of referred or publications from many disciplines. And we currently hope that one of his books will be translated in Vietnamese in the future. Over the years, Professor Musto has presented his ideas at over 130 academic events in more than 20 countries and has built an international intellectual network for research, partnership, and public engagement. He is the founding director of the Laboratory for Alternative Theories at York University and the editor of the book series Marx, Engels, Marxisms and crit Critics and Alternatives to Capitalism. Musto also contributes regularly to the several daily and online newspapers. His writings focus on socialism progressive social movements and left-wing political parties. Now I will leave and then, and now the floor is yours, Professor. Thank you very much. Thanks. And um, once again, sorry for this little delay. I'm sorry, I'm happy that uh, we were able to, to fix it. <clears throat> so I wanted to thank all of you for this opportunity to have this, uh, um, let's say informal discussion today. And uh, when I was contacted, um, uh, last month in April, we decided that um, we will have um, an open debate, like um, an open debate with um, young scholars, young students interested, particularly in Vietnam, but I've seen that um, this meeting has been extended uh, later also to, to India. Young scholars who are interested in Marx and reading Marx. And um, just um, a few months ago in, uh, in December, at the end of last year, uh, I've met um, online um, Sally Mew and the other colleagues in, uh, in Vietnam, and now we are working on a special journal after we had a big international conference that was focused on social science in general, but there was also a relevant part on Marx and Marxism, and we have been debating uh, in particular the contribution of Marx to anthropological studies. So it is in that spirit that um, I was asked today to respond to your questions, right? So the particular things of the meeting today is that instead of me presenting a long paper and having this uh, top to down presentation, um, I'm actually here available for you. And I would be very happy to meet a um, uh, young generation of students who are interested in learning about Marx and reading Marx, and then perhaps also contributing in the future with, uh, with scholarship. So I would like to add to this just um, a sort of a short biographical information about me, because you have been very kind and you presented me with, uh, I don't know, the titles of my books, of the series that I direct, etc. But um, a couple of decades ago, uh, I was just a young student like you, and um, I was interested in Marx, so how I started. I was interested in politics, I was interested in, 
in this world that is um, not working at all, that is full of problems. And um, the last couple of years have demonstrated this from many points of view, from the pandemic to the war now. And Marx has been the author, Marx has been the philosopher, the revolutionary that provided the most interesting keys for me to understand society. So this is how I started to read Marx, how I started to approach Marxism, not because I was um, aiming to become an academic. That is something very important. And perhaps we will also discuss the, this the sort of academic side of scholarship, the scientific side of scholarship, but the political implication of this, right? So the importance of you know, being an activist, a young student like Marx himself was, we should not forget this, that Marx was not born like a genius or like a man who was you know, aware of all the critique of political economy, all the information about I don't know, Europe or other societies around the world. So Marx at the beginning was just a very brilliant student, but a student like you, a student like us. And uh, actually when he spent the beginning of his life in Bonn for one year, and then in Berlin, the capital of Germany at the university, he was um, very enthusiastic and also used to do some, I don't know, games with his friends and, uh, uh, it was his father who moved him from Bonn to Berlin because he wanted to make sure that the young Karl was going to study and was not going to um, be too much a young um, rebel without um, working and studying too much. So it is in this spirit that I wanted to communicate to you that you don't have to be scared when you approach such a big author like Karl Marx or such a big topic like Marxism, in particular in your country where Marxism is the sort of state ideology with many difficulties, with many uh, contradictions, etc. And if I can end this um, introduction, this presentation, I would like to tell you that it was also my case when I moved to Berlin, when I started my PhD, and I used to enter in these big libraries and sometimes there were entire rooms of books dedicated to Marx, only to Marx. Marx is much, much more. So the question that you always ask to yourself is, what can I bring more to this discipline, to this idea, to this um, theory? And uh, it is actually possible to do it. And uh, in my case, I was trying to work, to study very hard, and then I was among the many other people who in the last 10 years in particular, if not a little bit more, if we count the economic crisis of 2008 and the return to Marx, among the scholars who created this sort of Marx revival, as I like to call it sometimes. So this new approximations to study of Karl Marx that is becoming so important and so relevant in several countries around the world. So my introduction is very simple, is this one, but I would be very happy to exchange, um, I don't know, questions, a conversation with you. And if I'm not wrong, my host uh, Sally told me that uh, there will be some questions and somebody will ask me questions. So I'm very happy and I am at your disposal, of course. Yes, that's right, you will do that. Hugh, can you ask him about the questions that we have prepared? Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so uh, Professor, I would uh, I have uh, provide provide you with a very extensive list of questions, and now I will begin with the very first. Okay, so uh, we'll start off with a question from one of our aspiring academics: How can one become a Marxist scholar? Do you have any lessons, advice for people who want to begin to study? and research Marxism in a more serious way? Hmm. Thanks. Well, this first question seems connected to the introduction that I was doing, right? Because how to become a scholar of Marx, how to contribute to this big discipline that is um, Marx research, Marxist studies, um, huge, right? 
Um, so it is very close to what I was trying to mention at the beginning. I would say that the most important thing at the beginning is to read Marx. So I belong like, for example, with my students in my universities or when we do some reading groups among activists, I believe that the reading the classics and in this case, reading Karl Marx is essential. The first point that I would like to communicate to you is the importance of not having other people reading for you. And then they tell you in other books, handbooks, introductions, etc., what they believe Marx is, what they believe Marx has said, what they believe that, I don't know, Marx's opinion about that particular topic is. My recommendation, the first one, is to read Marx, is to always read the classics. This is essential. Of course, you don't have to talk, you don't have to read everything, right? Particular for these important authors. But if you want to become not only a serious Marxist scholar, somebody who is doing a research to contribute to Marxian thought seriously, but you know, you want to be a good reader, you want to be a good student, a good young researcher, my recommendation is read the classics always, first of all. And then after you have read them, you use other books, the so-called secondary literature, to understand, to receive some help in order to better understand that particular word, that particular concept. And in doing this, I suggest that you do this with an open mind. So instead of reading just one author, you will read several authors. So instead of reading only one interpretation of Marx, you will read two, three different interpretations so that you get help, some extra light, I would say, to better understand that passage, to better understand that theory. And then later, if you want, you can return to the source. You can return to Marx. You can return to his writings, appreciating a little bit more, a little bit better, what you understood, what you read at the beginning. And then you can say, oh, I agree with this interpretation, with the Frankfurt School, with critical theory. Oh, I agree with this interpretation, with Louis Althusser, with French structuralism. Oh, I find that the ideas of Rosa Luxemburg are the most interesting to continue Marx or to better understand, you know, the critical approach to Marx, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I invite you to read the text, to go to secondary literature after you read the text, to read different things and then to return to the main writing so that you are sure that you have not lost anything. And most importantly, that you have not delegated to other people the work that you have to do, because it is you, the person who must read the author and must try to understand. That's why I'm often against these books, introductionary books, where there are the ideas of Marx that are condensated, they're put together by other authors, and sometimes there is very little of Marx in those books. And this is a history that is very well known in the 20th century, you know, when there are this compendium of Marxism or all these old textbooks of Marxism, for example, in Soviet Union, there was very much Stalin, there was a lot of Lenin, but there was very little of Karl Marx, right? So this is one, one thing. The second thing that I want to tell you is that I believe it is important that you try to work and to study very seriously on history, because it is for you essential to understand the historical context of the text that you are reading. One word means different things if you put it in one context or into another. If you read the word democracy in the classics of, I don't know, Greek philosophy, democracy means one concept. 
But if you read democracy in 1848, after the French Revolution, etc., it means something completely different. In the first case, it means that only a part of society is free, but there is slavery, because there was slavery in Athens. In the second uh, part of the 19th century, when Marx is an activist, when Marx is writing Capital and many other of his books, well, democracy means something else means that the working class, the proletariat, is not satisfied or the more political rights that the bourgeoisie provided, that the bourgeoisie were able to get after the French Revolution against the aristocracy, but the proletariat, the working classes, they wanted more social rights, social changes, so an economic transformation of the society. So going back to my uh, suggestion, try to read very carefully and try to study very carefully history and the historical context. Also to avoid dogmatism, because you want to avoid that a word or a concept you believe that is always valid in every society, in every time. It is not like this. And Marx said that very clearly, very strongly. If I write something, this is for England, this is for Europe, but this is not for Vietnam. Vietnamese society might be different. You cannot apply my theory as it is a schema, as it is a theory, something that can use, can be used dogmatically everywhere. This is something that is very clear in Marx. And also the question of the time, of the period of history, something that was possible, interesting, politically right to do in 1848, perhaps is not interesting for us in 2022. Marx did this and wrote about this several times in his life. So history is very important. And if I can end with another suggestion, I will just focus on three. Um, I will invite you, and I'm particularly glad to be in touch with you and to be your guest today, I will invite you to study languages. To study languages is one essential task for an intellectual, for an organic intellectual, like Gramsci used to say. So somebody that is not only reading books for herself, for himself, but reading books in order to be connected with a political dimension, with the collectivity, the political party, the social movement, the trade unions, whatever it is. Languages are important, and Marx and Engels knew that very well. Marx used to read, write, and in many cases also speak eight languages. And Engels was much better than Marx. He could read and in some cases write very well 12 languages. So I invite you to study languages very carefully and to become fluent with English, with friends, if you want to become, as this first question is asking, serious Marx scholars, at some point you will also have to do a little bit of German. So this is something very important and this is also something wonderful, like a little treasure that you will have in your life, for your life, because learning a language will open a new world for you. So this is my third recommendation and I stop here, otherwise this is taking too much time. Fantastic. Thank you, Professor. And I think your uh, view on uh, reading Marx is, uh, I think, uh, as a teacher myself, I think is very relevant and uh, very similar to the learning of everything, really. You have to put in the effort. You don't, don't rely on other people's efforts. You have to put in the work and then uh, new ideas and new interpretations will flow from it. Uh, however, I think this endeavor is also quite difficult because Marx's texts were known for being, for many people, for being extremely difficult and dry to read. So this is related really to the next question. So uh, in your opinion, what do you think are the necessary or mandatory classics that all Marxists should read, as you implied earlier in your speech? What are the like, absolute essentials that people should read? Hmm. That's interesting, and that's um, a question that I've been um, asked on other occasions as well, as you can imagine. It is also a question that can change, right? Because, I don't know, some people will have um, 
suggest to read many books of Marx, but not the newspaper articles written by Karl Marx. I will go back to this in a minute. But actually, after the economic crisis of 2008, many people went back to Marxist journalism because in Marxist journalism, he was criticizing and he was describing the first world financial crisis, the one that erupted in 1857 in New York, very similar to the economic crisis that we had in 2008. So as you can see, there could be a revival of a certain text, of a certain writing of Marx according to economic conditions, political conditions. Now, for example, in this week, we are discussing some interesting articles written by Engels against militarism, against war. Why? Because there is a political drama in our society, there is war again, and we go back to Marx and Engels, or we go back to Lenin and Rosa Luxemburg, and we try to see what they did in previous historical circumstances that were similar to ours or less, more dramatic. Having said that, I would like to answer to this question with uh, two small uh, premises, right? So I want to make a couple of points uh, like um, before answering the question. The first point that I want to make, there is a distinction in the production of Marx, in the intellectual production of Marx, between published books and unpublished manuscripts. That's very interesting. So Marx has written several books. Marx has written many articles, newspapers articles, as I told you, he was a journalist for almost two decades. And between 1851 and 1862, he was one of the most important correspondents from Europe of the most sold American newspaper, the New York Daily Tribune. So Marx is writing hundreds of articles in this period. He used to write more than 500 articles, many with the help of Engels, but that's another story. So I said published and unpublished. Why? Because despite the fact that Marx published many books, The Communist Manifesto, The 18 Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte, The Civil War in France, Capital Volume 1, the documents about the First International and many other less known books like The Holy Family, um, Misery of Philosophy, Her Fault and other, other things and then journalism, etc. Well, Marx has written even more and the majority of the things that he wrote were not published by Marx himself, were published after his death, were published by Engels, were published by Kowski, were published by Bernstein, were published by Ryazanov, were published by the editors in Moscow and in Berlin of his collected works, are published today by the MEGA, the second MEGA, the Marx Engels Gesamtausgabe, the critical historical edition of Marx and Engels that is publishing the notebooks written by Marx, unknown until a few decades ago, a couple of decades ago. So I'm trying to tell you this, that Marx has written so much, that Marx has conducted so much research in so many different fields that a part of the work that he has done was published by himself. Which part? The part that he felt completely sure about what he wrote. The part that he believed that he had made enough research to publish the book. But there were many other topics that Marx also researched very carefully, but Marx didn't feel that he had completed his studies. And therefore he waited, he waited. And then in the end, he was not able to publish this like Capital Volume 2 and 3, as you all may know. The other things is that Marx wrote many times many times manuscripts for himself, not only to publish, but manuscripts for himself, like you do when you have to prepare a paper 
when you have to make a presentation and you write some notes that you will need later to expand, to change, to improve. These are also unpublished by Marx. There are many of them, including one of the most famous texts and most read texts of Marx, the Economic Philosophical Manuscript of 1844. Some of these things were not written by Marx with the idea of, I will publish this. And we read this like this is a book written by Marx, but actually it is an unpublished manuscript that Marx used to do sometimes also for self-clarification to better understand what he was studying. So the complicated thing is that sometimes the unpublished manuscripts of Marx are more known than the books that he published. I mentioned this to you. Marx published The Holy Family, the first book that he published with Engels in 1845. Very, very few people have read this. Or Marx published a polemic against Proudhon, Misère de la Philosophie, Misery of Philosophy, but very few people read that in comparison with the German ideology or the manuscript of 1844 that I just mentioned, the Economical Philosophical Manuscript of 1844, that are very well known and where, I don't know, perhaps among the most popular and read documents in the entire 20th century, not only in Marxism, but in philosophy in general, in sociology in general, these books were very important. So it is too complicated to talk about this now, and this will be the topic of perhaps another invitation, another discussion that we will have. But sometimes it is very interesting to see the way one document, one text disseminate, one text becomes more important than other, even against the will of the author, because for example, the author didn't want to publish this, but then after his death, after her death, this is published by other students, or in the case of Marx, by his best friend, Friedrich Engels. Having said that, I will now take a couple of minutes more to enter more um, in, uh, um, with more attention, answer with more attention to the question what Marx should we read? Is essential to read all Marx to become a Marxist? Well, this would be very complicated because as you perhaps know, the Marx Engels Collective Works is 50 volumes, 50 huge books of more than 500, 600 pages each. And if you look at the mega that they're doing now, this new historical critical edition, well, the outcome was until a few years ago to publish 114 volumes. So it is, of course, only the task of a hero, of a specialist of Marx, to read all this, to understand all this, to digest all this work, and to really become a scholar of this author. In your case, I think it is important to make a choice and to start with some important things and then later to expand, 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 or to read some books of Marx, then do secondary literature, and then after you read some books on Marx, you can return to read Marx and expand to other books, to other texts. So what are they? Everybody usually starts reading Marx and Engels, like in my case, when I was 17 years old, with the Communist Manifesto. The Communist Manifesto is a political pamphlet, is perhaps, not perhaps, is one of the most read documents ever written in the history of the humanity, translated uh, in almost every language of the world, in the majority of the most important languages of the world, and printed and published in several, several millions of copies. Hmm? So writings like the Communist Manifesto, the political writings written by Marx eh, are very good places to start to understand what is the um, general ideology of Marx. 
Then after you do this, you should read the most important book written by Marx. That is Capital Volume 1, published in 1867. It is not a simple book, but it is not a book that was written just for scholars, like many other uh, volumes of the time of the 19th century. Marx wrote that books for the working class, for revolutionary people to understand capitalism and not only understand capitalism in Europe, but to understand the general tendency of capitalism. So if you skip some very difficult parts or chapters, like sometimes it has been said, particularly the first three chapters, there is a lot of history that you can use in order to understand in which context capital was written. You remember I responded to the first question by mentioning the importance of historical context. And there are essential chapters like the one on surplus value, just to make one example, that are the very, some of the most relevant topics written by Marx, some of the most relevant concepts uh, developed by Marx. So you need a guide, uh, you need a selection, but capital is of course something that you want to read. And then you can also read some historical or philosophical documents written by Marx. Some in relation to, I don't know, political events of his maturity, like for example, the civil war in France, the description of the Paris Commune, 1871, or, for example, the analysis of France after 1848. Marx has written about this. Or, even more, the articles that Marx wrote on India, on Asia, for the New York Tribune, there are many interesting things. Or, the philosophical writings, the most important one, the most beautiful one, is the one written by Marx when he was very young, only 26 years old, the manuscript written in Paris um, on philosophy and economics, when Marx is putting together the critique of Hegel and the critique to the classics of political economy, Smith, Ricardo. This is very interesting. So, I will start from this, politics, economics, history, philosophy, and then I will return to Marx to go more in depth and to expand what you have read in the first round now after good introductions to Marx, including intellectual biographies of Marx, because you have to know who is Marx, what kind of person he was, what difficulties he had, when he was working and writing his books. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Professor. Okay, since uh, almost all of the uh, remaining questions are quite long, so I'll be uh, picking, picking and choosing some of the shorter ones because we really don't have enough uh, sufficient time left. Okay, so uh, one question uh, came from Mick Chen. So uh, the question is something that I think a lot of people have been asking themselves. And I think a lot of Marxists could not answer, really. So uh, it's, it's as follows. What is, a, what is an easy or short definition of Marxism that one can share with non-Marxists uh, or those who have been hostile to Marxism that will not scare them away or provoke them? That's interesting. Well, I will say that this question could be complicated for some people, but for me, it is not. I have a very clear definition of what Marxism is in my mind. And it has always been like this. Marxism, the theories of Karl Marx, the ideas of Karl Marx are theories that should help society, human society, to move forward emancipation. Marxism is a theory of emancipation. I know that Marxism has been associated in the 20th century several times with oppressive political regimes. And unfortunately, right-wing ideologies, 
liberalism, neoliberalism, right-wing parties have at the moment won the ideological battle about this important question, the question of freedom, the question of liberty, because they represent liberal freedom, their ideology, capitalist society, like the society of freedom, the society where people are liberated, they are free. But we know that this is something that is at least, at least very, very contradictory. There is something that belongs only to a small part of humanity, what Marx used to call the bourgeoisie, the owners of the means of production. But the other people are not free. They have to sell their living labor in wage labor, in this society with wage labor. So how do I define Marxism? I define the ideas of Marx, the things that Marx himself really wrote, and the ideas that Marx had, the revolutionary struggle that he did, he did also when he was a political activist, like emancipation. We have to use Marx's ideas to emancipate society, to, to expand the freedom of human beings, to expand the liberty of human beings, to liberate times of our daily life, of our life from work into joy, into freedom, into enjoyment, culture, happiness. And this is something that is of course not starting with Marx, but it's something that already existed just to stay within our tradition in early socialists, people like Saint-Simon, or even more than Saint-Simon, Charles Fourier in France, Robert Owen in England, and many, many other. So I think that we have to make a distinction, and this is an important task of our generation, with the political ideology and the political experiences that sometimes were disastrous in the 20th century associated with Marx with other political experiences of labor movement, of socialism, of communism, of Marxism that were extremely relevant and important in the 19th century and in the 20th century in order to help people to emancipate, to liberate themselves from capitalism. And there is a lot of this and there is a, a very important tradition, a significant tradition from this point of view. Many communist parties, many liberation movements, trade unions, social movements, socialists, communists, anarchists, they struggle for this. And Marx himself is clearly belonging to this tradition because when you read Marx, you read a theory that is also a theory of freedom, that is a theory of emancipation, that is a theory of expanding and increasing wealth. Socialism is not poverty for everybody. Socialism is a society, is the construction, the making of a system of a society in which we are all um, um, live in better condition, not the generalization of poorness, for, for people. That's why, for me, the short definition will be this one. Marx's most relevant ideas goes in the direction of liberties, freedom, emancipation. Fantastic. Thank you, Professor. And uh, as you uh, uh, entered the uh, meeting, quite a uh, at, uh, quite a, at a very fairly uh, late, uh, at, as, as you uh, uh, entered the meeting, 15 minutes late, uh, I, I, I'm wondering if it's okay for us to extend the Q&A session for another 15 minutes, if that's okay. Yes, of course. Okay. Okay. Yes, uh, and uh, I'll proceed to a few questions by the audience here. So I, uh, I'll be asking you one question from one of our members. So uh, thank you, um, Professor Musto. Very critical and on point. Uh, I also find I also I sometimes find it very difficult to understand Marx's texts. So what would be your advice to help us better understand uh, his writings and to clarify his ideas uh, in our heads? Yeah. Hmm. Uh, is the person there? 
or this is just um, a message that you receive? Because I would like yes. to ask the person what kind of text he has in mind. Sometimes, if it is an economic text like Capital, I might give one suggestion. But if it is a philosophical text, like, for example, the philosophical manuscript of 1844, I might give a different answer, a different suggestion. So is the person there or should I provide just a generic uh, answer? I think um, you could provide, uh, I think you could provide both descriptions, if that's okay. Both, both guidelines for both the economic uh, manuscripts and philosophical writings, if that's okay. Yeah, so Marx was a, a very brilliant mind and used to live in a society, Germany of 1840s and uh, a very important university, Hegel, was professor at his university. Hegel died in 1831 and Marx arrived there a decade after. And beside this, Marx has been reading, studying, working 12 hours per day for his entire life. So you don't have to be frustrated, as I told you at the beginning, when you don't understand something, particularly for those of you who still lack the understanding of Marxian terminology. And I don't know if this is a question coming from a student who is reading in Vietnamese, translated from Russia, from Chinese, etc. So it is important to read Marx and perhaps uh, Sally and I can do uh, one of the next translation of my articles could be something about um, what to read about Marx and providing this uh, introduction things, right? Because I see that the audience is, uh, is very interested into this, like, you know, providing materials and also learning a little bit more about um, the chronology of what Marx has written or, you know, translating an intellectual biography. That's why it's important because you see what the author is doing when he's writing. Because, you know, once again, Marx is a human being like us and Marx is working very, very hard when he's writing the texts that are difficult for you to understand. Also, Marx is doing his own work in studying philosophy, sometimes understanding very complicated authors like, I don't know, Hegel, for example, right? So try to read the accessible parts of Marx. And after you have read this directly, you can take some introductions to Marx or some anthologies to Marx, for example. Um, the most important political um, um, adventure of Karl Marx, experience of Karl Marx, has been the International Working Men Association. That was the first international association, organization of the working class. That's why it is called the first international. And it was something that exists between 1864 and 1872. Now, how is it possible for even very brilliant students to read and understand all the documents of this uh, organization? Very difficult. We're talking about thousands and thousands of pages. So what I've done in 2014 has been to edit an anthology. This is available on my website. And there are many books of mine that are freely available on my website. I'm sure that Sally will share this information with you. You can just download it. It is called Workers Unite. This is an anthology of the most important and relevant documents of the First International. So that you don't have to read thousands of pages. But you can just take an anthology that is a guide to the most important parts. Another example, last year, I edited a collection on the alienation. Alienation is a very complicated concept of Marx. And in Marxism, there is alienation, reification, fetishism, commodity fetishism, and many, many other complicated things. So 
you cannot read the entire 50 volumes of Marx and Engels and understand what alienation is. But what you can do is to get an anthology like mine, where there are 40, 50 pages of introduction, the history of this concept, where this concept is coming from, who used this concept after Marx, how people changed the meaning of alienation after Marx. And then you read 100 pages, the most important texts, the most important documents, the most important definition that Marx gave to alienation, how they changed, how they evolved. So these are concrete assistance that you will receive when you have difficulties reading Marx. Please don't forget, not because I'm suggesting that you do not read Marx and read an interpretation, a book of a Marxist instead of reading Marx. No, but starting with Marx, starting with the easy parts of Marx, and then later using introductions or secondary literature to read better the most difficult things. You will make it and you will enjoy this and you will be more satisfied because you will say to yourself, I have read Adam Smith, I have read Max Weber, I have read Karl Marx. So you will engage directly with these very important authors of the humanity. Wonderful. Thank you, Professor. Now I will be uh, taking one question from our international audience. I'll be taking, okay, so, okay. okay. So that question would be, uh, this is uh, uh, Mr. from Mr. Viraya from India. The varied series you are editor titled Marx, Engels, and Marxisms. Marxism is only a philosoph political philosophy developed by Marx and Engels, but you titled your series as Marxisms with plurals. So what do you mean by that? That's a very interesting uh, question. And I actually um, am very grateful uh, to uh, Verayan to, to ask this and to call the attention of the audience of this point. There has been uh, perhaps a sort of an endless debate in the 20th century about the question of Marxism. Like, and this is a debate that was not only epistemological, not only theoretical, but also, and perhaps even most importantly, a political debate. So let's suppose that Marx is dead, and we used to know Marx, and our names are Karl Kowski, Edward Bernstein, Wilhelm Liebknecht, etc. Or a generation after people who never met Marx and Engels, like Kowski, Bernstein, etc., but they read their texts and they belong to the Communist Party, etc. These people argued that they were the only people who understood Marx and their, their theories, their ideas were the natural continuation of Marx ideas. And most importantly, the things they used to do in politics, the political choices that they used to do were the things that Marx would have done if had he been alive. From this point of view, there is a tradition of sometimes also, we have to say, very dogmatic Marxism, in which people said Lenin is the continuation of Marx, Marxism, Leninism, this is the only possible Marxism, or under Stalin, right? Stalin used to say, this is Marx, this is Engels, this is Lenin, this is my thought, and this is the Institute for Marx, Engels, Lenin, Stalin. So it is, it ended to be something very dogmatic, and it ended to be something that, in some cases, looked like a religion. The idea that there is a scientific thought and, you know, the party or that political leader or that philosopher is like the proprietor, the owner of the idea. So when I suggest, when I decided to use Marxism in plural, what I wanted to do, what did I want to do? 
I wanted to try to do the following things. I wanted to say, Marxism was the most relevant political ideology in the 20th century, but it has been defeated. It has been defeated after the fall of Berlin Wall, the Soviet Union, etc. So from this point in the last three decades, we have been defeated by liberal ideologies, neoliberalism in economics, etc., etc., etc. So now we are rethinking Marx. We are rethinking Marxism, critical theory, and we want to reorganize the left. We want to reorganize the political forces for emancipation, for social justice, for freedom, for the things that I mentioned before. I call the series Marx, Engels, and Marxism plural for this reason, because I believe that in this work of rethinking the foundations, why rethinking the foundations? Because the working class has changed, capitalism has changed, the political form cannot be only the political forms that we knew in the 20th century. So we have to rethink and update without abandoning Marx, without telling, you know, we do post-Marxism, we accept market, we accept capitalism, etc. No, but there is the need to bring new forces and to, of course, extend our theory, which is what Marx himself did. Because Marx said, after me, you have to continue. And also the reason why Marx didn't publish his own writings, because he was not sure, he knew that there was the need to do more research. Hmm? So when we do this today, it is my opinion that we should do this with open mind, with pluralism, with this pluralistic approach. I think that we should maintain something very strong, something very solid, and that is anti-capitalism. That is the key idea of Marx. The idea of building a society that is completely different to capitalism. A society in which human beings do not work, do not live in the isolated way, in the individualistic way of capitalism. So we put this line and we say we are in the anti-capitalism um, um, theories, ideas, political practice. But when we go there, there are different Marxism, there are different contributions. Antonio Gramsci, the most important Marxist of my country, he was very good in pointing out the relevance of education, the relevance of ideology. This is one Marxism, this is one contribution. Rosa Luxemburg, among many other things, she was so brilliant to say, you know what, we should fight against militarism. We should declare war to war because this is an important dramatic characteristic of capitalism. And this is another Marxist, this is another approach. And there are many, many other schools. But I want to say even more, if I may spend just one minute, Perhaps it's a little bit too technical for a part of the audience, but I want to say this. As a serious editor of this collection of books that I publish, I want to avoid that we only publish book, books of American professors, British professors. So I want plurality of interpretations, not only from the political point of view, but also I want scholarship from the global south. I want people who read Marx politically in Latin America. I want people who show me how Marx is helpful to do understanding of, I don't know, um, subaltern classes in India or the transformation, the return of capitalism in Asia. So Marxism for me means pluralism, plurality, and this is for me important to avoid one big mistake of 20th century Marxism-Leninism. This idea that there is only one truth, only one ideology, only one Marxism. So I think that today it is very important to put a clear line and we say the anti-capitalist, we should unite, we should fight together, we are also very weak 
in the present circumstances. And we have to discuss among us. We have to communicate among us. We don't have to fight you know, this school against this other school in this classical struggles, battles of the 20th century, communists fighting against each other or believing that socialists or social democrats are the same of fascists like it was done in 1930s, for example. So Marxism, that S after Marxism, means pluralism, means the need to take, to consider different approaches from many political views within the anti-capitalist point of view and approach and from many parts of the world and influenced by many Marxists. I made the example of Gramsci, Luxembourg, but I can do many more who lived after Marx and who developed Marxism after Marx and Engels died. Thank you, Professor. Uh, and uh, I think I, I think we can squeeze in one more question. And uh, I think we should keep it a bit brief because uh, we don't really have much time left. And it's quite late in Vietnam. Okay, so my uh, question is related to your previous emphasis on pluralism. So. Uh, Previously, you emphasized that uh, we should uh, probably explore ideas from other corners of the globe uh, really related to Marxism uh, and not just Europe. For example, Marxist writers in South America, maybe indigenous writers as well. So my question is that uh, who are the most prominent Marxists in the global South that you think are especially relevant uh, in today's context? <laughs> Well, it would be, if I have to be brief, if I have to just take one minute, I have to be short, um, I will not mention one name or two. I invite you to go on my website and under book series, you will find the many publications. We have 75 books published and more than 70 forthcoming in the next two years. So there is more. But I want to answer this by mentioning some tendencies that exist in some countries. For example, Brazil is surely a place where there is a significant revival for studies on Marx and Marxism, and some of these are not isolated. Majority of them are not isolated in universities, but are connected to the attempt of changing, transforming the society. That's one example. But, you know, Latin American is interesting because it is a society in which the left, in many forms, with many contradictions and problems, but is still very strong, right? So we can look at that as a political um, laboratory for, for the future. But there are also other parts of the world, including Europe, but I'm talking just about the global south, where there is a return to Marx. For example, in Japan, Today, there is the attempt to read new ways, to read Marx in new ways. For example, putting emphasis on ecological transformations, right? And on these ecological ideas of Karl Marx. So that's nice, that's good, because in South Korea, in Japan, etc., we see that there are scholars who are trying to return to Marx, but not with the classic thematics, topics, that we know class struggle, et cetera, without abandoning them, but also opening to new things. And I also want to say that it was Marx himself that at the end of his life, he went to Global South, not physically or just a little bit because he made a trip to Algeria and he spent a couple of months in Algeria, but because the Global South became the main focus of Marx's analysis at the end of his life. And for the periphery at the time, we can also include Russia. And Marx spent a lot of time working on Russia. I see that the question is too long and I have to stop here. And um, um, that's, that's fine. Sorry, I will be shorter next time you will invite me. But the positive message that I want to provide, there are new tendencies and Marx is widely read. And with Marx also other authors like Gramsci, Luxembourg is widely read in the global south. And hopefully this little event that we organize today will also help to bring 
new bread, fresh bread to the readers and to the scholars of Marx in Vietnam. So I thank you once again for the invitation and uh, hopefully we will do more after my book will be translated and there will be surely other occasion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. And uh, I'd like to extend the thank you for all of our international uh, attendees. And since the next 30 minutes will be conducted entirely in Vietnamese, uh, I think it is safe for our international non-Vietnamese speaking audience uh, to leave the room. And then uh, we will provide you with the recording of the uh, session later on. And uh, if you uh, uh, if you need any uh, some further information on Marxism in Vietnam, uh, you can contact Sally and perhaps uh, mm, uh, me. And uh, you can find us at uh, Vietnam Young Marxists on Facebook. Yeah, that's that is our handle on Facebook. And thank you so much for attending. Yes. And thank you, Professor. Thank you very much.